It's all dark. Anyway. So, uh, you all know Gabrielle Shedrins. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. And Christine Callan? Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, they make me these shirts. So, this one is. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's got like seven jokes built into it, yeah. so you guys can stare at it while I lecture you. <laughs> I'm not going to stand here and... <laughs> <laughs> pause! <laughs> 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 Break the pause, please. I will be getting a screenshot of that later. Okay, it's not on camera. Okay. Here, we should put it on the camera. <laughs> okay, anyway, all right. Um, normally, I would start by asking if there are any questions about what we talked about last time, but are there any questions about what we talked about last time? We didn't really talk about physics, but if you have questions about... No, you don't. Okay, good. All right. Uh, so Wait, are, we starting, you, huh? are we going to be starting at 515? No, from, we're starting Well, at, from here, from next week on out. Oh, yeah. So what do you think? <laughs> yeah. Thursday starts. Well, no, Gabriel has. Well, I have to leave 15 minutes early anyway, so I would just be leaving a half an hour early. Oh, you don't leave a half an hour early. No, we should start at 5 on Thursdays. We'll start at 5 on Thursdays and 5.15 on Tuesdays. It's not going to be hard. You could show up at 5 on Tuesdays. It's just we can't start at 5 because the, you know, this room is going to be opened up and joined with the other one for the end of colloquium so anyway it doesn't matter just 5 15 on Tuesdays and 5 on Thursdays I don't want Gabriel to have to miss half a half an hour of class although the first 15 minutes of Thursday's class by the way is going to be your homework quiz we're going to do those on Thursdays this year and not on Tuesdays which means I'm going to have a late set of office hours on Wednesday <laughs> you look angry oh no I'm just you're going to have to remember that. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, yeah, it's okay. All right. Uh, okay. Symmetry. 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 Ha! Here we go. <laughs> I just got this brand new box of markers from Barbara. And she's like, you want some markers? I was like, yeah. You want black markers? Yeah. I missed. I'm not a very good uh, <laughs> magic mark. Okay. I just... Oh, thank God. Something's working. <laughs> okay. Oh, by the way, uh, hopefully you got my email and you read it. Um, when I was showing the correspondence principle between quantum and non-quantum theories, I put my arrows the wrong way. So you want S to be larger than H bar, not smaller than H bar, in order to get uh, classical limits. Um, anyway, uh, and that was pointed out by some person on YouTube. Not one of you that I, I think could have been. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> oh, um, did I you think point I, it out? Um, no, I didn't. I think I, I was gonna. Say, I, I think I was gonna say something, but then I decided no, I'm not gonna say. Well, it. say something when I make. I'm gonna break cancer for Christ's sake. You gotta point out when I make mistakes so that I can Sorry. get mad. Oh uh, sure, blame the hole in your brain. <laughs> oh, yeah, so, so, so. Okay, so symmetry. <laughs> All right, so symmetry, how many of you have like seen and used symmetry before in a class? Yeah, I mean, you should have seen it at the end of Physics 1. At the end of Physics 1, we did gravitational calculations and we used symmetry to simplify them. So symmetry is a tool that is often used in physics to simplify calculations. Okay, and you can, you can go back to Physics 1, the last topic, to uh, see examples of that. Um, but it turns out that, and we, and, and we will use symmetry to simplify things in this class, but it turns out that we're going to be even more interested in another role that plays, that's played by symmetry in this class, and that is that symmetry is what actually underlies the forces that we're going to be working with, okay? So we're going to develop symmetry principles that uh, sort of motivate the electromagnetic strong and weak interactions. Um, so just, just as an example of the different roles that symmetry plays, uh, symmetry has a huge role in special relativity, which we will study in detail, okay? 
But this, in this context, the symmetry uh, is more just forming the equations that govern the uh, context in which we're doing physics. Um, but the forces of the standard model, as I mentioned before, is where symmetry is actually the underlying principle behind the existence of those forces. So we're going to use symmetry uh, you know, to simplify calculations or to even define uh, special relativity, to be honest with you. But then we're separately going to use it to define the forces uh, or to motivate the forces in the standard model. And that's going to be a, a theme that's kind of played throughout the semester. So it's not just something you have to take home from today. OK. OK, your first exposure to symmetry was probably of what I might call the static type. And I don't know if this is like a word that's defined somewhere, but I'm defining it for you. So let's go with it. And when you have a static type symmetry, what we have in mind, and this is probably your earliest introduction to symmetry, is I give you a shape, say an equilateral triangle, and then I say, okay, there's the equilateral triangle to start. What can I do to it that will make it end up in exactly the same configuration, looking exactly the same? And then you go, wow, you can rotate it by 120 degrees, and it will just end up looking exactly the same. Okay? So you take something that's an equilateral triangle, you rotate 100 degrees, put it back down, it looks exactly the same, that's a symmetry, okay? But this is a static symmetry, it's this object, and then you do something to it, and it's the object again, and these are the things that you're comparing, okay? This is in contrast to what we might call a dynamic symmetry. And it turns out that dynamical symmetries are what, we, what we're largely going to focus on in this class. Um, they're a little bit more, uh, well, they're a little less visual, but generally speaking, if I define the physics that I'm working with by a Lagrangian, then if I take the Lagrangian to start with and I let it undergo some transformation, and we'll look at different transformations that we do to the Lagrangian, then in principle, these transformations can change the form of the Lagrangian, and so we would get back an L prime, okay? But if these transformations correspond to symmetries, then it will turn out that the L prime we get back is exactly the original L, okay? Now, Lagrangians are not triangles, they're equations or their expressions involving uh, mass symbols and so forth. So this is a very different sort of context, but the, the looking the same at the end is kind of roughly the same idea, okay? But of course, Lagrangians aren't describing things just sitting there. They're describing the evolution of systems, stuff like that. And so that's why this is called dynamic symmetries. Now, in a lot of the examples that I'll play with in the, today's topic, I'll, I'll hang on the static examples because they're easy to visualize and then we'll eventually move into the Lagrangian examples because that's what we're going to focus on in the class. Okay. Now, um, now there's something that's important about the idea of a symmetry, which is actually what we're going to spend most of our time today talking about. We take something and we transform it. Okay? It's actually the transformations themselves that we're going to focus on today. Okay? And then later we'll come back to saying, okay, I do transformations and then I want the thing to come back the same. I want an invariant. And we'll talk next time about how to build invariants and so forth. But we're going to go into the math of transformations today. And... Um, also, it's, it's kind of weird because we might, we might be looking at it and saying, okay, I have a triangle, I want a symmetry transformation, so I want to do a transformation on the triangle that gives me back a triangle. And I have a Lagrangian, I do some transformation, I get back a Lagrangian, which is the same as the original one. So you might think that all we're doing is we're taking things, we're transforming them, and we're getting back the same thing, which means we're working with nothing but invariants, okay? Now, if I have an invariant, 
or I have a collection of invariants, I can build an invariant out of them. Okay, like if X is invariant and Y is invariant, then damn it, the Lagrangian XY is invariant. Because I can do the transformation to this, transform XY, I get back XY, okay? That's fine, but it's really not very powerful. What we want to work with is not necessarily individual invariants. We want to work with things that do transform. Actually, maybe I'll do this. So we want to work with elements which do change under the transformation at hand but we want to then take them and build something out of them, which is a composite, is invariant. Okay? Does that kind of make sense? Okay, I mean, we're gonna do this in detail, but it, it's, it's gonna, we'll just say that. I mean, we're not just gonna focus on invariants under transformations. We're going to talk about things which do transform and then we'll later learn how to put them together to form invariants because that's where you really get a rich um, amalgamation of transformations and symmetry. Okay. So, transformation. And if at any point you have a question, just ask it. It doesn't really... So in fact, I'm going to erase the word symmetry so we're not too stuck on it. Transformations come in many varieties. There's a lot of words that are affixed to it. Um, they include global, local, discrete, continuous, finite, infinite, space-time, and internal, among many words that you can throw onto describing transformations. Any questions? We're going to go through each and every word. Okay. So I'm going to start with uh, global versus local, because this is perhaps one of the most interesting. So, um, so in example one, I'm going to consider a system which is a collection of nine dots. Okay? And again, these are going to be static examples. They're just pictures you look at. But all of the... Uh, all of the discussion I'm going to talk about translates directly into the dynamic transformations or the transformations of dynamical systems as well. Okay, so the transformation that this example is going to work with um, is going to be translations of the dots. Okay, so I just translate the dots, all right? And um, I can first of all imagine translating the dots to this configuration. Okay. And you'll notice that the symmetry is preserved that was experienced in the original system. Alternatively, I could translate this dot to here, and this dot to here, and this dot to here, and this dot to there, and that dot to there, and there, and there, and there. You deleted one dot from existence. Did I? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Or it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah. I, I projected my counting ahead to nine and stopped. Anyway, okay. So, um, so my first question is, does this enjoy the symmetry of the original configuration? No. Okay, so we got non-symmetric. All right. Ready? 
Which one would you call global? The first one. The first one. Okay. And this is local. So the difference between a global and a local transformation is with a global transformation, you take all of the things in your system and you execute the same action with them all. Okay? Whereas with local transformations, you can take different elements of the system and have them undergo different transformations. Right? Now, This is immediately telling us something, right? This is telling us that if you take a system and undergo a global transformation, you're always going to maintain the symmetry that you start with. But if you undergo a local transformation, what are you going to do the symmetry? You're going to do what? Symmetry. You're going to do what? Depends on the symmetry. Change it? Um, unless, uh, unless you uh, are very careful, the local transformation will break the symmetry. So generally speaking, from this example, you might be led to believe that a local transformation breaks the symmetry. Well, there's two important statements to be made. Number one. Number one. <coughs> if I choose to move everything to this position, is that a global or a local transformation? It's both. Because global just means I have to move everything together, but I could choose this as a result of a local transformation. However, if I act on things differently, is that a global or local transformation? Local. It's only local. Okay? So what I mean is if I have a system which is invariant under local transformations, I can also do global transformations on it, and it will also be invariant. But I could have a system which is only invariant under global transformations, and if you try a local transformation, it won't be invariant. Okay, then that's very important. It's incredibly important. But here's my second comment. It's the second example. Let's do a system that is invariant under local transformations. Why not? So. My system is going to be, instead of points, spheres or circles. Okay? And my transformation is going to be rotations through the circle centers. That is, I take each circle and I rotate it. I can do this globally. I can take every circle and I can rotate it 45 degrees. In this case, it comes out like that. That's a global transformation. But if I do a local transformation where I do 45 degrees, 32 degrees, 97 degrees, 81 degrees, 63 degrees, 45 degrees, 2 degrees, 0 degrees, and 180 degrees, guess what it looks like? It looks exactly the same. This is an example of a locally invariant system. I can take my system and do local transformations, transforming each thing differently, and the system looks the same. Again, these are static examples that you can look at, but we'll find analogs in the dynamical things. We'll find that in a Lagrangian, there are situations where we can only do a global transformation, but if we're really careful, we can write down a Lagrangian which is invariant under a local transformation. Okay? Any questions about local versus global? Yes? So if you were to say, like the first example, um, and you had those nine dots, yeah, just like that, but you had them go in, I guess, local transformation, say you move the first dot in the top left corner to the bottom right corner, then could you still, you could still, you know, flip them like that. You'd still get a symmetric pattern at the end, but each dot went under a different transformation. Does that make sense? If you, if, so if I move this yeah. down here, move this up here, and move 
this appear? Yeah, because then each one is going through a different transformation. It depends. It depends. Can I identify, can I distinguish these dots? That's a question. Yeah. If I can distinguish the dots, then this is the only symmetric version. If I can't distinguish them, then yeah, then what you're talking about would work. I can't think of an analog of that in dynamics, but in these static situations, yeah, that would be a that would be a local transformation, which it would be a local trans it would be a local transformation under which this is invariant. Yeah. It's a special local transformation, though the general set of transformations I'm talking about, this is not invariant under them locally. But there are special ones where it would be. Yeah. Good good observation. Okay, so other questions? How are we doing? Is this way too slow? Boring? Stupid? I'm looking at my GR notes from last year. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> now you're just. Oh, okay, that's fine. Don't, you can, don't go too far on the GR notes, though, because we, we do. They, they kind of go like this <laughs> at a certain point. Yeah, so. The examples are the same. <laughs> Shh. <laughs> They're really, really, really freaking good examples. <laughs> Discrete versus continuous. Okay, so um, discrete transformations. Um, I'm going to do a couple of examples here. First of all, we can take an equilateral triangle and consider rotations that put it back in the original configuration. Okay, obviously you can take an equilateral triangle and rotate it one degree and it, it's still an equilateral triangle, but I'm talking about rotations which carry corners into corners, or put corners where corners were before the transformation. Uh, this is finite. All right. And, and I'm speaking to physicists, I'm not speaking to mathematicians, because there are mathematicians who would say, oh yeah, you could combine this and this and not call it the identity and extend the shit out of that, and I'm not going to worry about that. There are three things you can do, and after the R240, if you go another R120, you're going to end up with it exactly how it started. Okay? So this is a finite thing. There's a finite number of transformations that you can do. Okay? Each transformation carries the corners back to the corners. Right? So this is the identity. This is the rotation by? 360? <laughs> yes, but what else? 720. <laughs> by what? 720. By zero! <laughs> it's a rotation by zero. It's, it's going, oh, I'm going to rotate it. <laughs> okay, so that's the identity. And then R120 is just one, and then R240 is the other, and then I leave out R360 because R360 is the same as the identity. Okay? Is everybody clear? <laughs> not way too much fun. This is ridiculous. <laughs> okay, so here's another one. Um, let's take a network of dots, which goes to infinity and minus infinity, and then let us consider translations of the sets of dots so that after you translate all, so these are global transformations, you translate all the dots, the dots end up overlapping where there were dots before. So we can shift everything by one dot separation or by two dot separation or three dot or four dot or five dot and we can also go to the left. Okay? How many transformations are there here? At least three. Probably a couple infinite. more than three. Infinity. There's, infin there's an infinite number. Okay, you have an infinite set of things and you're shifting them over each other, but you can go off. I mean, look, you can shift by one, you can shift by two, you can shift by three, you can shift by four. When, is my, when am I going to be done? When I hit infinity, and then I'm going to go in the negative direction and hit infinity. Okay? So, these are discrete transformations uh, 
And you can have them come in finite or infinite sets. Now let's talk about continuous. For continuous transformations, are they going to be finite or infinite? Infinite. They're going to be infinite. Okay. Let me show you an example of a continuous transformation. It'll be obvious. Let's take a circle and consider rotations that leave the circle looking the same. Okay. Well, these are rotations by an angle theta, where theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. How many rotations are in that set? <clears throat> There's infinitely many, because the parameter which governs the rotations takes a continuous range of values. How many numbers are between 0 and 1? An infinite number. How many angles are between 0 and 2 pi? An infinite number. And I'm not talking about theta equals 1, theta equals 2. No, there's theta equals 0. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. And then there's a bunch smaller than that. And yeah, so it, this is a continuous parameter, which means there's an infinite number of rotations that I'm considering here. Now you can, you can just, just as a side note, you can jump up to three dimensions where you have three different rotations, and each of those are infinite. Okay. Now my second example though is going to be, and all I'm doing is continualizing these, my second example is going to be a segment which goes to positive and negative infinity. And then I want to think about the transitions that I can do with this segment that leave an invariant. Okay. In case you don't remember, square bracket means include this one, round bracket means don't include this one. This is just a statement that our rotations go from 0 all the way up to 2 pi, but they don't include 2 pi because 2 pi is, is exactly the same as 0. Okay, and I want to write down the set of unique rotations. 2 pi is the same as 0, so that's not a unique element. This goes down to negative infinity and up to, neg up to positive infinity, but never actually reaches them. How many are there here? How many? Infinite. It's, it's infinite. Oh shoot, I, did, I forgot to write down two words, but I'm going to write them down in just a second. This list is incomplete. <laughs> okay? So here we go though. Um, with continuous transformations, we always have an infinite number of transformations, but there should be something different between these two examples, right? Because here, we've got an infinite number of transformations, but they span an infinite set. So it's not the distance between two things being infinity, it's the fact that you go from plus infinity to minus infinity. Whereas here, it's a finite set. It's got an infinity because there's infinite things between them, but there are bounds to it. Does that make sense? We can't call this infinite and non-infinite, or finite, <laughs> because this is infinite. So we have two new words. This is called compact, and this is called non-compact. Okay. You might give me an example of a compact set of transformations other than these. And I'm speaking to my GR students. Ross, <laughs> who wasn't a GR student, but go ahead. Well, um, uh, one example I'm thinking of is like, um, it's a, the, all the different possible three-dimensional uh, rotations. Yeah, rotations. I mean, in rotations in three dimensions, all of the angles are fixed to ranges between 0 and 2 pi or 0 and pi, depending on how you define your rotations. Who can give an example of a non-compact group? Well, that's what this is. Who can give me another example? The boosts. Boosts. The Lorentz group is non-compact. Because when you're boosting, you're adding a 
relative velocity between two frames, and what's the limit on the relative velocity? Okay. So, let me see. Yeah, okay. So, sorry, so I should add to this list compact and non-compact. Is there another example of a compact one that's not just more rotations? Yeah, all of the gauge groups that underlie the standard model. Okay. <laughs> are compact. Yeah, Ross. I just have another question. When you were mentioning boosts as being non-compact, I don't think that you could have a boost with a relative velocity greater than the speed of flight. It depends on how you define your boost term. So you can define your boost term, the actual, so you, you, the boost term can be a quantity which is going to infinity, but it corresponds to the relative speed going to C. Would that be like the rapidity? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, so I got, let me see, we did global, local, discrete, continuous, finite, infinite. Oh, we got to do space, time, and internal. Okay. So, um, Space-time, uh, okay, so space-time symmetries you can think of as um, I set up some coordinates. Might as well be relativistic. And then I can ask what transformations do I do on the coordinates. And then I have to ask how does that impact the physics, okay? This is space-time. So this includes rotations, it includes boosts, it includes translations. So those are all examples of space-time transformations. Internal transformations don't touch the coordinates. The internal transformations, um, and we'll, we'll work through this in complete detail, so I'll just spit it out, but it's not going to really make sense until later. Internal transformations you can think of as acting on a vector space which is not a vector space in space time but rather it's an internal vector space okay so you can't actually fly your spaceship through that vector space but there's a copy of that vector space tacked on to every point in space time and then you can do rotations through them so an example is those doublets that i showed you in the standard model everything coming in pairs so those form two orthogonal vectors in this internal vector space, and then you look at transformations that rotate between them. So those are internal transformations. We're going to study space-time transformations, and we're going to study internal transformations. We're going to do it all, okay? Although the internals will come a little bit later. We're going to start with special relativity and do uh, space-time symmetry. But all of the machinery that I'm going to work up can be equally applied between the two of them, okay? And, and I should say this, like, when I do special relativity, hopefully it will look cooler than you've seen it before. But most importantly, it will prove to be very useful the way I formulate it because I'm going to formulate special relativity in a certain manner that we can directly apply to the internal symmetries that underlie the forces. And if anything, it's giving you this universal notion of symmetry and how you should describe it and so forth. So. Okay, any questions? I have defined a bunch of words. We should do some physics, but I don't think I'm doing physics yet. But anyway, let's go. All right. We have got to organize our thoughts on transformations. Transformations are sets of things that, if you think about it, you should be able to take a transformation like a rotation, and combine it with another example or sample of that transformation, like another rotation, right? I should like take, I should be able to take a, an R of 90 and combine it with an R of 100 and somehow get an R of 190, right? What the hell am I describing? Rotations. Of course I'm describing rotations, Ross. That was the easy question. What mathematical structure am I describing? Addition. I'm describing a group. a group. So let's talk about groups. All right, a group G 
is a collection of elements This is just a set, so it gets the curly brackets on the ends, and I'm, maybe there's 10 things in this set, maybe there's an infinite, I don't know, just, just an example. With a composition, which I'm generically just gonna call a big dot, okay? that satisfies the following four requirements. Okay? And the word composition, the dot, this just means I can combine two of these and get another one out. Okay? So here are the four requirements of this composition law. First, there's closure. Anybody, anybody guess what closure is? <laughs> Maybe we should bring Ross to the front, and I'll just put my hand up the back of his shirt, be like a ventriloquist. Let's go. Uh, elements of the group. Huh? Elements of the group, can you multiply? I want to say multiply together, but there's other elements of the group. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, let me write that mathematically. You said it good in words, let me say it mathematically. If A and B are contained on G, are contained on G. I'll use that symbol from time to time, so I just point it out. Then, therefore, then, arrow to the right, whatever the hell you want to call it, A compose B must also be on G. Okay, so what all, all that means is if I take two of these things and I compose them, the thing I get, the single thing that I get out of that should also be an element of G. And we'll look at examples where that doesn't happen, and then we're not looking at a group, okay? So the second thing is we need to have an identity. This is pretty easy. There is some element, and some people use the letter E for the identity. I have no friggin' idea why. I'm gonna use I for the identity, but in if you're looking at references, sometimes they use E. So there has to be some identity element on the group G <clears throat> such that I compose A gives me back A for any A on G. Okay, I'm kind of writing this in that condensed math language, but you can always go back and hear the words in the video if you need. Okay? This just means I can take any element of the group G, hit it with the identity, and I just get back the same element. We know what an identity is, damn it. That's not that hard. The inverse. For any A on G, there is an element A inverse that is also contained on G, such that A inverse compose A gives me the identity. Okay? Russ? I just have a quick question. Yeah. Um, so is it a requirement of a group that, like, a that like you know that a compose i is equal to a is that a requirement of a group or can you have groups where the identity is does not commute with uh, the elements of the group so the identity must always commute but the elements themselves don't have to commute and i'll I, i'm going to talk about that in a minute so yeah you you could have equally said a compose i and similarly down here, you could have said A compose A inverse to the top. Okay. Sorry, stupid question. No, 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 it's not a stupid, it, I was actually thinking about that when I wrote that. I was like, maybe I should write A dot I, but I'm gonna talk about the commutativity in just a moment. Okay, and then lastly is associ associativity. And associativity 
you should have learned in elementary school, I think. Okay, A compose with the result of composing B and C should be the same thing as A compose B, the result of that being composed with C. It's, it's really hard, I mean, personally, when I look at this, I immediately want to just stick numbers in there and multiply them. Right? I want to be like, oh, if this is, if this is 5 times 6 times 3, yeah, that's 5 times 6 times 3. Of course, this is so stupid. So stupid. But no, 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 you have to remember this composition, this dot, this could be a lot of weird stuff. This could be matrix multiplication. Okay? It can be a lot of things, and it's not obvious that associativity is going to hold, but it has to hold if your set of stuff and its composition is going to form a group. Okay? Now, we could impose that A compose B be the same as B compose A. That is, that you can commute two things and it doesn't change anything. If so, then what we're working with is what's called an abelian group. And if you look at these and, you, and, your, and your mindset like mine jump straight to numbers and multiplication, then damn it, you're dealing with an abelian group. You know, because five times six is the same as six times five. So, all right. Or, we could have a situation where if you compose two elements in the opposite order, you get a different thing. And that's called a non-abelian group. Okay. We are going to work extensively with non-abelian groups. Almost every group we work with is non-abelian. Okay. But almost every group we work with it's a group. <laughs> okay. Almost every group. <laughs> every group we work with is a group. If you're wondering how you might relax some of these, you can actually relax the closure condition and get what's called a groupoid. And then you can relax other things and get up, but we're not going to do that. Everything we're going to work with is going to be a group. Okay? Any questions? Okay, so one more idea, and then I'm going to move on to a related concept. Uh, how many of you have seen any of this before? Like group? Good, good, good. And if you haven't, it's fine. You know, this look, looks all kind of formal, but it applies to... So I'll tell you this. If you just think of matrix multiplication, that's a really nice example of all of this and the non-abelianness. You know, because the identity, oh, that's that matrix with ones down the diagonal. And then inverses, well, you know, the matrix has an inverse. It's not obvious what it is, but, um, and associativity, unfortunately, associativity is still easy and closure and so forth. Anyway, okay, so now I want to ask a question. So I've got the set A, B, actually, let me, let me say this. Identity A, B, C, D form a group. Okay? Does A, B form a group? So there's no identity in there. You have to have the identity for it to be a group. Okay? Would that have a problem with associativity just because... Shh. Okay. <laughs> Would I, A, B form a group? Is B the inverse of A? Ah, well, we have to explore. Okay, well, if the rules here are that A inverse equals B and C inverse equals D, does this form a group? Yeah. Is yeah. A, is A the inverse of B? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. 
What do you think? So all I'm saying is, if you have a group and you take a subset of it, that subset, as long as it satisfies these conditions, can itself form a group, and that's called a subgroup. Okay? And two of the things you always have to look out for when you're trying to form a subgroup is you have to carry the identity in with you, and you also have to carry the inverse of every element that you're putting into the subgroup. Okay? And then actually, you got to make sure you got closure. Okay, because just because these are inverses, so the inverse of A exists and the inverse of B exists and we've got the identity, it might be that A composed B gives me C, in which case this is not closed. Okay, so, and I'll have examples of non-subgroup sets of transformations in a couple of minutes. Yes? What would you need there to be closure like with because above you said it's like the elements are um, like in the set of G. Yeah. With but this isn't G. This so, so this is your G prime. Okay, so and this like is your G closure in G. Prime. Yeah, it's got to be. I mean, I'm calling this a group, so the multiple or the composition of two things has to give me something that's still in that set. Okay. And, and in fact, this is the best way to find sets which kind of look like a group but aren't a group. And that's, that's the examples that I'll show you in just a minute. Okay. So we're going to look at some examples which will hopefully uh, bring some of this home. Any other questions before I... Yeah, go for it. Question? No question. Uh, I was just wondering if you could have the same element, like two of the same elements in a group. So... Like, as you were saying, if... Uh, that? Kind of, yeah. Would it be non-unique? It's not a set. Well, no, th this is fine, but redundant. Okay. I mean... So it follows the, the rules. Huh? It follows yeah, it follows the rules, but th this is literally just two copies <coughs> of the exact same thing, so... I mean, yes, it's allowed, but it doesn't give you anything new or interesting. Questions? All right, so now we're going to move on to something. <laughs> How many of you took abstract algebra? Okay, abstract algebra teaches you about group theory, and that's it. They don't teach you about representation theory, which is all the physicists use. So let's talk about representation theory. Um, let me see if I should keep that up. I'm going so slow with you guys, but it's fine. It's fine. Okay. Doo -doo -doo -doo. All right, I'm going to erase this. Hopefully, you've got all this written down. I'm going to need the space. Okay. Outer space. God, why do it's amazing how fast an hour and 50 minutes goes? Okay. So, um, now. When we, you got to be a little bit careful because we quite often will define a group, say, rotations in two dimensions, okay? And when I say rotations in two dimensions, you're, well, most of you are physicists, <laughs> but... <laughs> I looked over at that end of the room, but don't worry. Where does your brain go in terms of, oh, rotations in two dimensions? I have to use what? Matrix. A matrix, a two by two matrix acting on a two component <laughs> vector, okay? So is the matrix and the vector that it acts on, is that a rotation? Mm. Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's a bit subtle. So, um, to talk about rotations in 2D, I should just think about taking an object and rotating it. <coughs> think about matrices yet, okay? And the composition is 
if you take two different rotations and you want to combine them into a single rotation, all you do is you take the angles and you add the angles. That is very different than saying I have two rotation matrices and to get the combined rotation, I just multiply the two matrices together. It is not obvious that multiplying two matrices together corresponds to the two rotations they correspond to just adding their angles together and getting a single rotation. Okay? So I'm going to give a name to those matrices in just a minute. Um, so a representation And there's a slight variation between my definition of representation and a mathematician's definition, but I think mine is better, so I'm going to give you mine. Um, a representation is a collection of things acted on by group elements. when the elements are transformations. And um, how the transformations present themselves. And that's a lot of words, so I'm obviously going to uh, illustrate this with an example, how the transformations present themselves. Okay, so let me give you an example. So the group G is going to be rotations in a plane Rotations in a plane that carry square corners into square corners. Okay, so um, what I mean is I have a square. And I want to do a rotation in a plane, and I want the corners to end up back where there were corners before. Okay? Um, in my notes, I have this written by 90, but I actually think I want to specify it this way to be more accurate. So, uh, What's the composition? You can perform multiple rotations. No, what's the composition rule? Uh, addition. Of? Angles? Yeah, the angles of the angles of rotation. Okay. All right. So I'm going to give you several different rep representations of this, though. So the R1 representation. What I'm going to do is I'm going to label each corner by a letter. And remember, I'm not interested in invariance. The letters can move, but I'm only considering transformations where the corners end up where there were corners before. OK? So how many distinct transformations can I do? Four. What are they? Um, identity, 90, 180, uh, 240. Okay. Let's stick with. I think it's 270. 270. <laughs> I'm just writing down what you say. If you say it wrong, you know, it's going to come in. Sometimes I lie. <laughs> yeah, you do. Okay, everybody see that? 
you know, I can do nothing. I can rotate at 90 degrees, in which case A goes to B, B goes to C, C goes to D, D goes to A. The letters are in different places, but I've still got corners where there were corners before. Okay? Now I'm going to give you a different representation. How many transformations do we now have? Two. Two. What are they? I and R90. I and R90. This is because if I go by 180, I end up with the same letter assignment that I started with. Okay. Well, let me do one last one. So these are representations. transformations can I do? One. I can do one. I can do the identity. Now, very, very important idea. If all I gave you was a square and I said, what are all the transformations I can do that carry corners into corners? Which of these three representations really illustrates all of those transformations? Say it again. R1. It's R1. It's the first one. This is what we call a faithful representation. However, by labeling the corners A, B, A, B, what we discover is that R180 gets degenerated into the identity, and R270 gets mapped onto R90, where, of course, these are mapped. And so this is called a degenerate representation. Well, if I take every goddamn element and map it to the identity, that's called the identity representation. You ready for something cool? Does this form a group? Does it? Are you checking those four things? Don't worry about associativity. Never worry about associativity. Mm -hmm. Does this form a group? We'll think about what it's acting on. Yes. Does this form a group? Does it have the identity? Does it have the inverse of the identity? Is it closed? If you do the identity Whoa. times the identity, do you get back the identity? Hell yes, this forms a group. So all of these representations are representing the group. But there's varying levels of richness in them. Okay? In physics, we often have to assign things to be in representations of a particular group. And we often have to assign things to be in the identity representation. Okay? Let me give you an example which will make a lot more sense than we'll learn about later in the class. The strong interactions, QCD, only impact quarks. That means if I have an electron and I do the transformation that underlies the strong interactions, the electron can't be touched by it. What representation do you think the electron lives in? It lives in the identity. Whereas the quarks live in the faithful representation. Okay. So we'll come back to these words at numerous points. I just want to get these ideas out there. Okay. Um, okay, so um, 
So, uh, you're probably all aware that uh, drawing squares and equations kind of sucks. What do we want to write our equations in terms of in order to encode transformations? Matrices. Matrices, okay. Matrices are powerful enough that their matrix algebra can encode a lot of the information in groups and representations and so forth. So let me very quickly give you an example of uh, matrix representation. So, and this is where it sucks that I deleted it. So I'm going to consider this group and the results of the four transformations did. Okay? And now what I can do is I can take this state, this state, this state, and this state. Now I want to I want to be careful. Again, it's one of those subtle things. There's so much subtlety in this. <laughs> um, are these the elements of the group? These pictures I'm showing you. Yep. Well, they are and they aren't, right? Because the group is the transformations between them. Remember I wrote down I, R90, R180, and R2. No, 40. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, I'm sorry. <laughs> Those are the transformations between them. You can't sit there and look at that and go, that's R90. Because if you start here and go here, that's R90. If you start here and go here, that's R90. This is R27, no, sorry, this is R180, but so is this. So the group is the set of transformations between them. But we're using actual objects that the transformations act on to sort of flesh out what the transformations are. So the, the, the representation idea carries two things. It carries the things you act on and the transformations between them, but it's the transformations between them that are the group elements. Okay? All right. Now, I'm going to label each of these states, and then I'm going to write the transformations between them. Ready? Why not? There you go. Each state is labeled by a column vector. And now I can write down the matrix form of the transformations between these. We have four of them. I'll go first <laughs> with the identity. Is it card time? Huh? Is it card time? Oh, shit. <laughs> Yeah, it is. Oh, look, Avery's on top. Jesus. Any idea what R90 looks like? Let's say. No, Avery, no, no, no. You don't have to guess it. What is R, what is, if I apply the R90 matrix to this, what does it have to give me? Zero, one, zero, zero. It has to give me this. If I apply it to this, what does it have to give me? Actually yeah, so you can actually write, you, you can work out what the R90 matrix looks like, and I'll just write it down because it's not obvious at all. You just say you would have the one down, so you shift all the rows down. And then I'll go ahead and write down R180. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, RT70. Okay. 
it's it's not obvious what these are. You'd have to just you know write down some matrices with some unknowns, apply it to this, say you want that, get a few of those unknowns, then the same here, get a few more unknowns, and okay. I want you to take a minute. What are we describing? Locations in space. In what dimensional space? Two D space using four by four matrices. But it works. Okay? Everybody agree it works? That's good. That's good. It works. It works. Okay. Um, now, what's wonderful about this set of matrices is that they satisfy the group requirements. If I take any two of these matrices and multiply them together, what do I get? One of, the One of these four matrices. That's closure. Okay. What's the inverse of that? R270. R270. If you actually work out the matrix inverse of this, you'll get this. What's the inverse of this? Yeah. Itself. Okay. Is the identity in the group? Oh, yes. So the matrix multiplication rules are encoding for me everything I need to know in order to demonstrate that this is a group. And yes, it's associative. Okay? It turns out this is commutative as well. You can do R90 times 180, or you can do R R180 times R90, and it'll be the same. Okay? Now, in many situations, we'll use matrices with real components. But in many situations, we'll use matrices with imaginary components. Okay. Hopefully, you're all relatively comfortable with imaginary numbers. This isn't going to be a course in complex analysis, but we are going to use I uh, from time to time. So, um, any questions about this before I finish up? Okay. Uh, by the way, I'm opening up your first homework tonight. It's going to be due next Thursday, and you're going to be working with this quite a bit. Okay, so you'll get more comfortable with it if you walk out of here and you're a little confused and you don't remember it, that's fine. That's what the homework is there to help you uh, solidify. Okay. All right. Oh. Um, if you have a finite group, and uh, the example that I just gave you is a finite group, so I can do this. Um, you can't do this with a continuous group. We'll talk about that in a second. But if you have a finite group, um, then there's this thing you can construct called the multiplication table. And I will just write down the multiplication table for the group that we just talked about. Time, I would have a student come to the front and fill this in. So you take the one on the left and you hit the one on the right. This is an abelian group, so you could actually do it either order. But what's I composed with I? I. It's I. And then if I go across the top, it's I composed with whatever's on top, so that's easy. And if I go down this way, it's also I composed with whatever's there, so it's also easy. And then we get R90 composed with R90? R180. R180 composed with R90? R270. R270 composed with R90? I. I. Okay. R180, R180. I. R270, R180. R90. Good. And R270 composed with R270? R180. Okay. This is a way to illustrate every single combination <coughs> result. Okay? Now, you know, do you really need to do, I mean, you could have just kind of looked at the list of four things and said, oh, if you multiply this. Well, there's a reason for these multiplication tables. Okay? 
First of all, if you draw a line down the diagonal and the multiplication table is symmetric, what kind of group is it? Abelian. It's abelian. Remember, abelian says that R90 times R180 is the same as R180 times R90. Okay. If it's a non-abelian group, what's over here can be different than what's up there. All right. Subgroup. No, it's not. You can see because if you just take I and R90 and you write down the multiplication table for that, it includes R180, which is not an element of that group. So this is not a subgroup. So multiplication tables can be nice ways to identify whether something's a subgroup because if I, if I you know, take a square and everything is contained in the square, it doesn't have anything outside of it in terms of the elements across the top, it's got the identity, it's got inverses, and it's going to form a subgroup. Okay. But here's perhaps one of the most powerful things about um, multiplication tables. I could talk to you about two completely different groups of transformations. Okay, I could talk to you about rotations. Hold on, let me think. Uh, 